Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things. A podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode two, video game monetization. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my intelligent and insightful co-host, Sam Whalen. How you doing today, Sam? Doing okay. So we are broadcasting live on Twitch right now. Unfortunately, we seem to be having some technical issues, so uh, it might not look so great on Twitch at the moment. We apologize for that. <clears throat> So what we're talking about this week here was actually a topic that you had uh, proposed. Um, you wanted to talk about loot crates and the effect that they're kind of having economically and uh, legally in some cases and on the, in the, the gaming industry itself. Um, and in doing the research for that, it, in, in my experience doing the research, it turned out to be a lot deeper than just loot crates. And I thought it would be worthwhile to touch on some of the additional details uh, of that. So what was originally a, what I thought was a fairly straightforward topic turned out to be a lot more complicated. So we'll start off talking about what we're referring to when we say video game monetization. And we'll go from there, okay? Sounds good. All right. <music> So what is video game monetization? Well, for the purpose of this discussion, video game monetization is the ever-evolving process that a video game publisher can use to generate revenue from a video game product. The methods of mon uh, monetization may vary between games, uh, especially when they come from different genres or platforms, but they all serve the same purpose to return money to the game developers, copyright owners, and other stakeholders. As the monetization methods continue to diversify, they also affect the game design in a way that sometimes lead to some criticisms. Now, before we start the discussion, I do want to throw out there, in the interest of total disclosure, for the better part of the last 20 years, I've worked in the software industry in some form, not specifically the game industry, but the software industry from a commercial software standpoint. So there's a certain familiarity that I do have with the development process and the market drivers for it. So I just want to throw that out there right off the bat. Um, and to start this off, I do want to, you know, let me ask you, Sam, um, what do you think of the current monetization methods? Do you think video games are overly oppressive in how they're trying to get money out of people at this point? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I think, I mean, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, I think most games, AAA games coming out today are designed to get as much money out of the consumer as possible. Um, and <clears throat> we'll touch on it later, but the different methods used for that can vary from, you know, not as bad cosmetic items to super aggressive game altering um, mechanics that can give some players an advantage just because they've got a bigger... Uh, you know, bigger bank account. Yeah, and I think that's where some of the criticism really comes from is when you get into that play-to-win sort of model that we that we see a lot these days. Um, so let's talk about some of the, the main methods of monetization. Um, and we go back, you know, we're going to start off with the original retail model. You know, you go to a video game store, you purchase a title whether it's for pc or console or whatever you take it home you own that title for as long as you want it and for as long as you use that equipment that you're playing it on um that's a fairly 
antiquated model at this point in time, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, GameStop's still around, but they're routinely laying off people. They actually recently just changed some of their stores to make them more... Um, uh, they, they change the interior so they have more computers and game consoles set up to try to make people stay in the stores. Um, and they also sell a lot more physical merchandise like shirts and, and other kind of um, <clears throat> uh, non-video game kind of items like that. So GameStop, who was the biggest probably distributor, the first one that comes to mind when you think of physical uh, retail, they've been struggling for probably the last five years. Yeah, and recently GameStop had acquired ThinkGeek, and they've been basically carrying all the pop culture merchandise that ThinkGeek had as another stream of revenue for, for what they're trying to do. Um, and I think that change in attitude from a retail standpoint is sort of driven by the move that we've seen with the release of, to a certain extent, the Xbox 360 and that generation, you know, the PS3s, and then the PS4s and the Xbox Ones, where you're moving to a digital subscription mode or, or digital retail mode is what they often refer to it as where when you purchase your games, you don't walk into a store. Now you don't put money on the counter and walk out with a physical item. You're making a purchase through your online account now, and you're downloading the software to the hard drive in your device now. Um, and this is, this is a method that, that first hit computers. I mean, computers with, um, Steam and other origin uh, gaming services had sort of this model in place well ahead of the consoles. And the consoles were kind of late coming into this this mode of pushing it to you. And um, that was really one of the big concerns a lot of people had when the current generation of consoles came out and you were going to be able to buy your content. Um, cause the one concern that, that this brings in is mobility of your content now. Mm -hmm. So in a retail standpoint, you could go out and purchase a, uh, a, a CD that had your game on it. You could take it out of your console, go over to your friends and play it at your friend's house. And when it's now digitally signed to your console, you're much more restricted in how mobile you can go with that. Aren't you? Yeah. And, and. It's also, it takes up more storage in general on your console because you have to download the whole game right. um, where instead of just having the disc. And that's kind of part of why the digital distribution has risen in the last couple of years is because consoles are getting bigger storage. They're able to use uh, external hard drives and internet in general has gotten more high speed so you can download those things. Whereas before you just didn't have the bandwidth to do it. Yeah. And in fact, I know I was telling you earlier before the show that I had just picked up, um, picked up figuratively speaking, of course, the latest uh, Star Wars uh, Jedi Fallen Order game. And, and I bought it digitally through the Microsoft Store, and it was almost 38 gig of a download that I managed to pull down inside of less than an hour, which from a technology standpoint is pretty, pretty impressive, you know, th that I can get that kind of content down at one shot. And never have to leave my house for that. Yeah. But part of that that comes with that is you're only licensing the game. So you don't have that physical copy. So if for some reason tomorrow, Microsoft said, oh, oh, you can't have that anymore. They could yank that off your account theoretically, even though you've made that purchase, which is kind of where some of the people that are diehard physical copy users, that's kind of their argument that they say, I'd rather have something I can hold that, you know, can't be taken back someday, you know. And that is a very good point. That actually kind of... Um, takes us into the next method of monetization, and that's subscription-based in general. Um, in a subscription-based general model itself, you don't even own the licensing for it. You own it for as long as the company allows you to play it. And a couple of examples of this are um, Origin Access, uh, PlayStation Plus, um, the newer ones that are coming out, Google has Stadia that's coming out now. Um, basically, you pay for a subscription. You get that subscription for as long as you have the service itself or until they pull the games off of that service. 
Yeah, I use um, Xbox Games Pass, which is 15 a month, I believe, 15 or 16, and you get access to a lot of games. So for someone like me that might not want to spend, and I know subscription kind of sounds bad because they could take it away even more at any point, but for someone like me that doesn't want to spend $60 on three new games, I can pay $15 and play play them after the fact because Xbox Games Pass has... Um, when first-party Xbox Studio games come out, they go right to Games Pass. So you can get something like um, whenever the next Halo comes out. you can inst- Instead of paying $60, you could theoretically get a, a free trial of Games Pass, play it for free for a week or whatever, and see if you like it. So for people that are not looking to spend that much on games, it does give them you know more economic um, option. Now, do you feel that you're getting your money's worth out of that? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I don't really... Everything I play on my Xbox, I play through Games Pass, so... Yeah, see, and and prior to this model, <clears throat> your subscriptions, because you had game subscriptions in the past, but those subscriptions really were services. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the first one to come to mind is the is uh, World of Warcraft. So you you pay for the initial install of World of Warcraft, but the game itself doesn't work unless it's online, and unless it's online with the World of Warcraft servers. So basically, you're renting that service at that point in time. And with our new subscription models that we're seeing, instead of being a single game service, now you're getting an all-you-can-eat buffet. Um, Apple Arcade is a similar type of service that's out there. Um, and and that's sort of where the industry is going. And, and that's media in general. Uh-huh. I mean, everything's going to services from... Um, your video games to your movies to your cable, your online radio, uh, even your your office related software, uh, Microsoft Office three sixty five, your Adobe suites, everything's moving to a subscription model, and from a business standpoint, that's that's guaranteed return re- recurring revenue, um, and the other thing that it does is it kills the piracy that was rampant in the software industry um, despite various attempts to, to thwart it in the past. So there's two other things that, that I did want to mention before we get to really the, the heart of the matter that we have here. And that is um, lesser known ones. You have player trading and uh, player trading is a, Business model where in-game items and digital currencies can be traded between players. And usually a lot of this has to, like the video game that I play now, uh, Star Wars The Old Republic, kind of follows this model along with microtransactions. And that is they have an in-game currency, various in-game currencies, and in order to buy the vanity items that they produce on a regular basis, you need to buy it with a currency that requires cash to buy. So you convert money, real dollars, into this in-game currency, purchase the items off of their market, then you can take those markets and sell them for another in-game currency to other players. So a lot of what are labeled whales in the industry um, wind up buying off of this select market so they can sell to other users who don't have the cash. So what will happen is they'll go out and they'll grind various tasks in the game to generate this other in-game currency. Then they'll pay the whales for the stuff that they've paid cash for, and then the whales then take that ca- that in-game currency and then sell large amounts of that in-game currency to other people for cash to get back. Yeah, it's, so this it, is where we're getting into the real world consequences of this kind of thing because you're converting real money. You're dealing with real money uh, adjacent to in-game items and currency. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and this crosses international boundaries because these games are played around the world. And it's almost like a legalized form of money laundering uh-huh. when you get down to this. And it, it's a it's an economy that, that really is self-sustaining. Um, and as a result... And here's one of the negatives that comes out of that. The video game developers are driven more to produce items and and services for this artificial market that can be sold rather than to, 
to produce enhancements, real enhancements to the game, either content or bug fixes or whatever to keep the game itself going. Um, and, you know, the Old Republic is a great example of that where BioWare has dramatically shifted their development over to what they call their cartel market. So the cartel market uses cartel coins, which you acquire with cash through their website. And the majority of their development work now goes towards making different outfits to wear or vehicles to drive or whatever it is. And that's driving what they're developing and investing in the game uh, more than actually doing anything productive in the game. Um, so that's, that's a concern. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, they do that, and it's not just Bioware, but companies do that because it makes them the killing. I mean, they make so much money off of these, and we'll touch on it in a second, microtransactions plus the in-game uh, trading right. that it's just, they'd be ridiculous not to from a business standpoint. And that doesn't make it right, but, I mean, it's difficult to fight that when that is the driving force of a business is to make profit, and they're going to find the best way to do that you know, maximize efficiency and maximize profit. Yeah. And, and ultimately it's the end users who wind up losing out on that because you, you ultimately have a lower quality game. The one other thing I did want to mention before we get into microtransactions is advertising. Um, you find uh, advertising as a form of indirect monetization. So apart from the aforementioned methods of monetization, indirect monetization generates revenue from other sources and doesn't directly come from the player. So most frequently, this is in the placement of ads within a game. These make may take the form of a banner ad, uh, commercial breaks in play, or product placement in the game. Uh, games that rely on advertisements for return usually are the free-to-play games and are cheaper than other games in their production costs. A lot of times you think of... Uh, mobile games. Mo yes, thank yeah. you. Mobile games. So Bejeweled. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what's the one? Candy Crush. Candy Crush That's is another one. I can't. I keep thinking the one that had had Arnold Schwarzenegger doing the advertising. Oh, it's one of the tactical uh, RPG Forge games. of Empires, yeah, something, like, something that. like that. So yeah, it's these little mobile games that you know they'll let you play the game as long as you want for free but they're going to get advertising revenue out of you for that. This is crossing over to consoles as well. Um, recently, it was either NBA 2K19 or 18. Um, there was a, an update to it where they were showing commercials for in some show on FX. Like, as your game was loading, it would play these commercials. Now, you could turn them off in the settings, but initially they're enabled by default. So they got a lot of flack for that because we'll touch on probably later. Um, NBA sports games are already heavily monetized. Mm -hmm. So to have commercials for a TV show on top of that, I mean, people didn't really take kindly to that, especially because most of those games are broken um, in terms of bugs and glitches to the point where they can be unplayable. Oh, yeah. So yeah. to focus on advertising for a television show instead of fixing the game, you know, they got a lot of outrage from that. Well, and I think it was, I forget which one of the NHL games from EA wound up doing the same thing because just like NBA teams do for real, where they sell advertising in the arenas themselves, the game was actually selling advertising in an arena setting. Yep. And as a result, you were getting all of these um, theatrical camera pans and stuff like that that was slowing the game down and causing all kinds of problems just so they could pan the camera around and show you all the various advertisements that they had sold uh, that were on like the 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 boards there or the banners up top and stuff like that, um, so they were creative ways of having advertising creep into it, uh, but they weren't non disruptive. And the last thing here that I did want to mention here that was kind of the driver for this entire discussion is microtransactions. Um, so sometimes just abbreviated MTX microtransactions is a business model where aspects of a game's content can be purchased to enhance the game experience for the player. These aspects may range among new playable content, in-game currencies, cosmetic options, and otherwise unavailable or unrestricted gameplay advantages. Traditionally, these purchases tend to be relatively inexpensive, hence the microtransaction, but numerous in variety. 
Microtransactions are often common in social and mobile games where potential customers may be hesitant to purchase a full game, but more at ease with smaller yet more numerous payments. So the old adage of death by a thousand cuts. Um, this was your focus on the topic. So let's get your thoughts on this and I'll give you the soapbox, so to speak, to, to talk about this. Uh, well, there's a lot to cover. Uh, we're going to break it down in a second, but I think microtransactions are kind of like I said earlier, businesses or game companies make so much money off of them and that's why they put their focus there. And where you run into issues is where these are, these microtransact, it's hard to say, MTXs or whatever, <laughs> are affecting gameplay for other people. So if you can get better know, weapons in an RPG or better armor that make you better because you paid more, that directly affects everybody else's gameplay, which then encourages people to spend more money in the game, money that they might not have. <laughs> um, and this is a problem when it comes to children. Um, and when you get to loot boxes, how those are surprise mechanics, how those work um, in terms of gam like a gambling aspect with there not being a guaranteed return for what you're paying your money for. Kids are being targeted because they've got, they, you know, they can get their parents' credit card and they can spend tons and tons of money because they want to get the best skins or the best equipment out of this random gambling system, which is where a lot of the real world consequences can come from. Yeah, and when we talk microtransactions, there's there's two large areas that we talk about. One is downloadable content. Uh, so, for instance, you may purchase Modern Warfare, one of the games from the Modern Warfare series, and you get the base game. And one of the large aspects of, of these first-person shooters is really um, online player versus player. You're going out there, you're playing against other people. And what we find nowadays is that that base game only gets you so far. Um, not soon after the initial release, you start getting map packs to come out. And those map packs tend to be a good percentage of what the, the base game is. So in a given year, you could get five or six map packs. And those five or six map packs could total two to three times what the original base game cost. It's actually funny you mention that because the most recent Modern Warfare that came out last month um, has actually moved away from that model. They uh, The map packs are all free now, but instead they've replaced that with a, a battle pass system, which uh, Fortnite kind of popularized. Yeah. Whereas you're getting all your content for free, but you're ranking up in this battle pass by playing the game. So you can... It's more microtransactions where you can spend money to advance that battle pass faster and to get better in-game. Typically, um, it's all cosmetic items, but still people spend a lot of money on that. Right. So even the game industry itself is is developing, even just in the last couple of years, it's, it's been having these major changes. And the, um, the other aspect I did want to focus a little bit more on is the loot boxes where the loot box is a variation of a microtransaction in which it's it's a random reward for cash and this has been looked at by district attorneys around the country and it's been found to be illegal outside the country as well as a form of gambling and as you had mentioned previously they're targeting these towards minors mm -hmm. um and because of the very nature of the currency exchange that's happening here, they're starting to crack down on these. Um, Overwatch is is one that's fo been focused on a lot with this, with the cosmetic skins. So the argument that the game developer makes is that, well, these have no effect on gameplay itself. And that's countered by the fact that if I give you money and I have a random chance of getting something in return for it, that by its very definition is a gamble. Mm -hmm. And if you're only going to focus this on 18 and older, it's one thing. But because you're targeting these specifically at under 18, then there there's a major issue that people are running into with these. Yeah, and I, I play a lot of Overwatch. Um, I love that game, but it is definitely, there is an aspect of gambling to it. And I think... On the developer's side, well, they see it as it's not affecting gameplay. You still have the same chance of winning no matter what kind of skin you have, no matter what kind of cosmetic things you have. So it's not like you're getting that pay to win like I would mentioned earlier. But you have to accept some degree of responsibility and be realistic about it that people are spending lots and lots of money because 
these things aren't regulated and they have no idea what they're getting in terms of rarity chances, right. um, which I think some companies are. Ju- um, some do publish it. Now. Yeah, yeah. Because they have to, because they're getting cracked down by lawyers. Exactly. But, well, and, and the idea is, well, if we self-regulate, then the government doesn't have to come in and regulate. But they're not going to self-regulate because they're making all the money in the world, you know? Well, and that's the thing. What they're doing is self-reporting, not self-regulating. Yeah. So they're trying to give that illusion at this point in time so the government doesn't crack down on them. I think to really understand the whole idea of of modernization, of, of monetization of the video game industry, it's worthwhile to sort of take a look back at where the whole idea came from historically and how it evolved. So we'll talk about that when we come back. <music> So in the 80s and 90s, we had what was affectionately referred to as shareware. Um, Games, and this was almost exclusively the PC era, um, they were released in limited content versions, Wolfenstein being a very good example of this. You could get Wolfenstein, play a certain number of levels just to get a feel for the game, but if you wanted to unlock all the levels, you had to buy the full game. So it was playable up to a certain point. And that was enough to sort of dip your toe in the water there and figure out if it was a game that you wanted to play. And it, they they didn't cripple the game uh, as other people tended to do. Um, then we move into the 90s to the 2000s, 2000s, and we run into the Try Before You Buy, where um, it was perfected by Big Fish Games. A lot of people may, ref- may remember some of the games. They dominated the mobile markets for a while there um, and the web-based games. And they released um, via download uh, a game every day that was free for the first hour. And you could play it unrestricted. And then the player would have an option to buy the full game. Um, so they basically gave you an all-you-can-eat for a period of time and then gave you the option to buy it. And then Try Before You Buy moved morphed into the more familiar um, free-to-play models that we know of today, uh, where in this model, gains were free, um, and over 90% of the players would never spend money on them anyway. So the game developers would focus on that 10%, the whales, as we refer to them as. Um, however, they were built to get the most engaged players to spend and improve uh, to speed up. So this is where we got the play-to-win models out of our free-to-play error up until the 2010s. And some of the, the household names here, <clears throat> like uh, Atari and Acclaim and, and THQ, um, they wound up going bankrupt because these were the traditional video game guys who were trying to be, you know, they were stuck in the, in the original markets. And then you had people like Zynga who saw their valuation within a year reach $10 billion on these new models. And it was sort of this time up until, you know, in the early two thousands where the idea of, video game monetization really started to evolve. And we had a lot of people with a lot of different ideas, but a lot of money changed hands here. And then up into the 2010 to 2020 range is when we started getting into the subscription models that we had already talked about. Um, So this evolution of game monetization is really a pretty fairly new thing. It was small iterations here and there up until this point until we really hit the con- connected model that we have now. Um, and, and the other thing to mention is not only do we have the model monetization, but there is an incredibly high amount of tracking that goes on now on these video games. So, you know, we're granting, and people don't realize it, but when you install one of these games, you're, you're giving it access to your microphone and to your um, camera and to your GPS and to notify you. And, you know, you're in, in some cases giving it access to external accounts like your social media accounts. And there's this wholly connected model that they're using now where instead of the game being a revenue model for the software company, the player is now the revenue model. 
And it's not just from the money coming out of your pocket. It's from the demographics and the infographics that are coming out of the user. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is actually something we talked about in one of my classes um, at college. It's uh, I think it's called a dual product market where um, <clears throat> as a consumer, you are giving money, but you as the consumer are also a product. Um, and especially nowadays, you're more val- your money is not what's valuable. Your information is what's valuable. Your data is what's valuable. Yeah. And we could probably make a whole other show about it, but especially with these kind of things, um, how what you buy and how you buy them or where you live, everything about you is what's valuable to advertisers because then they can target and sell more products. And that information is critical uh, for that industry. Yeah, and you know, not to, to um, go too much off on a tangent here, but that this is the same model that social media uses now. Um, so you have... Uh, Facebook, and you've obviously heard of Cambridge Analytica and the effect that that had on the 2016 uh, election, uh, that was basically using Facebook's model that its its users are its product. The information that you generate is the product. It may be used to generate advertising. It may be used to sell that information to a political campaign. Um, it may be used to sell you a product. Um, one of the things that people are concerned about constantly now is they may have a conversation talking about an obscure product and then all of a sudden they start getting advertisements for it. It's like, okay, who's listening to me at this point in time? Which of my devices is listening to me? Um, and that's really how marketing is, is pushed now because there's so much information that's gathered and our video games on our cell phones mostly are, and now a huge driving factor in that. And it's kind of scary. Yeah, I think um, talking about listening specifically, I think a while back, I believe it was Microsoft got into some trouble because they were testing audio software with the Connect. Well, not the Connect anymore, but whatever their, I think it's Cortana, whatever their voice services on their Xboxes. And in testing it, they recorded children talking. And to tie it back into what we're talking about here, they got in a lot of trouble for that because you can't record minors without their knowledge or yeah. consent. Um, and they got, you know, I don't know if they got any legal trouble for that, but they definitely had to, you know, shut that down. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the, the article itself. So that kind of brings us, that, that's a good segue into the next um, topic that I wanted to talk about on this. And that is the impact of uh, video game monetization on the gaming industry itself. And there's really three key areas where we see that impact itself play out. The first is in market growth. Um, so in 2014, the digital download model made up 52% of all game sales and overtook retail purchases. Now that was five years ago now. So you have to imagine it's got to be pretty significant mm-hmm. now. The video game industry now continues to grow and generated over $130 billion. And this is across the board, all video games in 2018. Um, and the model has has shifted significantly to to all connected games, with consoles quickly falling by the wayside. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, video games have been around for what, like forty five years, fifty years, easily. And yeah. to make it already a hundred and thirty billion dollar industry by twenty eighteen, like that that level of growth is not seen that often. And now, especially developers with that monetization mindset, want to maximize that profit as much as they can you know, for even longer. Yeah. I mean, you figure $130 billion. If, even if you get 1% of that with a new game on the market, that's enough to put any game developer over the top at that point in time. So market growth is definitely something that monetization has had an impact on. The other is game design itself. And we've sort of touched on this um, earlier in the show, So since the method of monetization must be decided before the game production, it may affect the game's overall design and how players will interact with the game. Um, So if the first thing that they're thinking of, and really from a business standpoint, they should be, is how are we going to make games? Um, That's going to drive how the game itself is, is developed. So they're not, they're not, altruistic trying to to make the best game people want to play. They want to make the most money and that's always going to drive design. 
uh, monetization trends like uh, games as a service will shape how new games are, are designed as well, potentially making uh, genres that are easy to monetize more popular than others. So, for instance, sports games are notorious for modern monetization. Uh -huh. Usually it's one and done, and you might get a recurring revenue out of roster updates and stuff like that. There's really no need for microtransactions. So as a result, that's a completely different design strategy than these mobile games that we get. Well, you actually, you do get a lot of monetization with games like FIFA, and um, they've updated that more in recent years with uh, FIFA Ultimate Team, which is basically you get loot boxes which have uh, players in them, and you can range from good players to bad players in like a rarity scale, and then you build your team to play online against other people. So that's where they get all their money from is this the ultimate team. And it's not just FIFA. I think all the sports games have a version of it. But they're making a ridiculous amount of money just from ultimate team alone. And I think it hasn't been around. It only came out in like 2014. But every FIFA has had it. And if I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but a significant portion of the revenue from these games come from this um, online ultimate team style of, of monetization. Well, I know I've played uh, the EA uh, NHL, and it, it has an aspect of that to it, I guess maybe because I never really got into to making the purchases myself. Um, I've never experienced that, but I could totally understand seeing that in FIFA with how popular it is nationwide yep. and, and internationally. Um, the other thing that... that that monetization has had an impact on is legal consideration, which is what we're talking about with the loot boxes. So some forms of monetization have become uh, government con uh, have become a government concept as the as the uh, as an element of gambling. Um, and this is particular when they're targeted at minors. So not only do you have video games now driving how we market them, how we design them. Now you have how governments are reacting to them now where you've got uh, loot boxes, for instance, are considered a form of gambling in several Asian and European countries and are heavily regulated in those countries now. And the United States is looking at regulating loot boxes as well. So it's really the first time in history that you're seeing laws that are being developed to handle um, video games where you've had questionable um, practices in video games before with uh, depictions of violence and uh, uh, sexual acts and stuff like that have always sort of danced around the fringe of, of legal at that point. But now you actually have governments that are forming legislation now to deal with the effects of these loot boxes now. Um, I, I think that's probably the most significant development that we've seen uh, in monetization at this point in time is the fact that it's now driving legislation. What do you think about that? I think it's just a natural progression of the industry. I mean, before Mortal Kombat, there wasn't a rating system for games. I think it was Mortal Kombat. But Mortal Kombat was so violent that they had to People didn't want their youth exposed to this kind of stuff, and that's a debate for another time about video games and violence. But regardless, the type of game that Mortal Kombat was warranted some kind of regulation, and I think that the rating system is self-regulated by the video game industry. I don't think it has government oversight. It is, yeah. So I think that this gambling aspect of it is just something that falls under that umbrella as well that should be regulated. I mean, when electricity was invented, you could have 10 different companies on the same block but eventually the government had to step in and regulate that as well because it was affecting the consumer. And I think that this is no different. Well, that's an interesting take on it. I mean, I could certainly see us going down that route of, I, I guess, I don't know. I never thought that we would have to regulate video games from a legal standpoint. Uh, of course, I also didn't think that we would be targeting minors with early gambling too. And it's to the point, you know, some of these games are like, crack dealers at this point where the first one's for free and then we we're going to charge you for the rest at that point in time and we're getting kids you know as young as nine and ten years old hooked on it yeah and i mean a lot of that too you have a lot of big lobbyists that are in washington on behalf of large video game corporations like ea um it, infamously a while back they had the debate where the the lobbyists from ea used the term surprise mechanics which kind of got 
made fun of across the internet because obviously that's not the same thing. Right, right. But you have the lobbyists that are trying to minimize the impact that this gambling has when the reality is much more, much different, which of course, you know, that's how you have to deal with. That's what you see being dealt with with politicians is, you know, minimizing to get their eyes away from it. Exactly. Yeah, you know, smoke and mirrors as it may be. Yeah. So um, I think we've touched on most of the the aspects that I wanted to talk about. One thing I did want to talk about when we come back is what the future of we game monetization is that we think it'll be when we come back. <laughs> So, you know, I, I put a couple of things in uh, just as what, what my thoughts are here. And I want to run them past you and see what your thoughts are. And and really what I think the, the biggest uh, future of monetization is, is, is probably going to be the sub- subscription services that we're seeing now. And not the, the WoW subscription models. I'm talking more of the uh, Google Arcadia, Apple you know, plot arcade plus whatever they're calling it. But basically the, you pay for this subscription <coughs> to get your games and we're going to give you an all you can eat type of game menu. Um, what do you think of the future of that model? Uh, I think it's definitely going to be where everybody's headed to. I mean, like you just said, you named like three off the top of your head and there's countless more where that came from. I mean, someone did a tally of all the streaming services for movies and television, and it equals like more than a cable bill. Yeah. And it's only going to get worse because there's so many that haven't launched yet, like Peacock and HBO Max and all these. And that's just for television and movies. And I, I don't see any reason why video games wouldn't follow suit. I mean, it's it's uh, it makes them tons of money, and people forget that they have subscriptions that you know hit their credit card every month, and you think, oh, it's only what ten bucks, eleven bucks. You know, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'll cancel it next month, and then they don't. But then, if you me- if you multiply that number by what twenty two million people signed up for Disney Plus, then you've already made one hundred twenty million dollars just you know by that. Yeah, yeah, and and you know you're right. It's a model that works. Everyone's doing it. You know, you're seeing it with movies, with with television, with your office products, with your software uh, development products. Everybody, literally everyone, is going to it. Even with these, um, the random loot crates that you get at home. Not even just the ones you get in game. Like, you've got subscription services for miscellaneous boxes of stuff. Everyone goes subscription. You're getting food services as a subscription. Um, so this this idea that I can pay a little bit of money here and I get a value for it uh, without me having to worry about it. I don't have to, you know, pick up the phone and call someone to buy a license or go out to a store to buy a license for this. Um, I, I think it's a convenience of of not having to, to manage it yourself because it's a subscription that manages itself. Yeah, it's also kind of like what I said earlier, just a progression of the bit, the industry. I mean, before Blockbuster was the biggest thing where, you know, you could rent, and it wasn't a subscription, but you could rent DVDs, which was huge at the time because, you know, not everybody had all the latest movies. Right. And I think that subscriptions are the next step of that, where now that we've got digital IP that all these companies are fighting over, then your IP is what will make your, your brand the most profitable and the most attractive to consumers. And I think that's exactly where it's heading. Yeah, and, and it's a model where, you know, it's a coin of catchphrase, everybody wins, you know. Consumers win because the subscriptions uh, succeed in better aligning their customers to the, to the business models that they're looking for uh, rather than a linear model of selling a product to a customer. The, the subscription model creates a dynamic where the company constantly is trying to please the customer to keep them as a customer. Uh, it's not this buy something and come back to me and what have you done for me lately? Uh, and they allow companies to, to start um, their month or their year with a guaranteed base of business. So it, it kind of works across the board fundamentally. There are a little bit of negative aspects to it where smaller content creators and producers miss out on getting market share because of they can't compete with these streaming services or with subscription services. So, you know, smaller indie developers for games, there are places for them where that, that clientele can purchase their games. But when you're compared to something like an Xbox games pass that has, 
you know, over 150 games or something like that for $15 a month, AAA games that each would be $60 on their own right, the smaller producers and creators kind of get pushed by the wayside, which is, you know, that's what happens in big business anyway. We see that all the time. Well, and that's kind of one of the concerns that I had had with um, Apple and and their new arcade. Um, they're releasing games on a regular basis. And they, and like, they, we kind of saw the same thing with Apple News Plus, where Apple News Plus wanted to be an aggregator of various news magazines and other publications. And the problem that you had was there's a fixed amount that, that each of your readers is going to read. And they get everything. So that $10 a month that I'm paying has to be theoretically divided among 100 or more vendors at that point in time. So there comes a point where even in economies of scale, it doesn't scale. Um, and because in order for that model to work from a consumer standpoint, you have to have the, the amount of producers and the volume of content to make it worthwhile. And when you reach that threshold, even if you continue to double your membership rates, if you don't increase the cost of that to spread that money further as you spread your content base out, you're, you, can only, you can only spread the butter so thin on that piece of bread. Yeah, and you talk about that volume of content. I think we're way past that threshold now for every kind of content. I think there's there's too much to watch. There's too much to play for video games that it's you fall behind. And you have to pick and choose. And as a consumer, if I can save $60, or not $60, but save $45 and get a subscription service that allows me to play these games as they cycle in and out, then I'm going to go for that instead of, you know, dropping $60 on a game that I might forget about in, in two weeks. And and that's the thing. Like, you get a game, you know, I'll go with uh, Jedi Fallen Order again. So Jedi Fallen Order, on average, may give you 20 hours of gameplay before you finish it. What's the replayability? Is there an online gaming aspect of it where I can play against other people? I don't think so. I haven't found it if there is. So it's a game where I just spent $65 on this game. That $65 could have got me half a year of a, of a subscription service to play anything on that yeah. service that I wanted. And it's 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 unfortunate because that example, Fallen Order, it's an example of a great AAA single-player game, which the industry does not have that many of anymore. And it's because of things like this and the models that they set up for games as a service to be to have a game you pay your $60 and then it's monetized over the course of two years, something like a Destiny. Right. That single player games are getting pushed out, and not everybody can afford to keep up with a games as a service model. So some people want just a single player. I don't want to be online. You know, I just want to be. I just want to do my own thing. Right. And unfortunately, with, with the way things are going, you're not going to get that many games like that. Well, and I'll, you also look at the production cost of something like uh, Fallen Order, where it's got a production budget of a major motion picture. And in order to be profitable, you need to overcome that budget before you even see a dollar of profit come out of it. So you need to sell that $60 game to X number of people just to reach profitability. And in that kind of scenario, a subscription model just doesn't work. Because in a subscription model, that $10 that someone's paying for the subscription that they get your game through, you're getting 30 cents out of that. So the scale of the number of people that have to subscribe to it is so astronomically high at that point in time that the producers can't justify a budget for a $150 million movie or, or game, rather, in this case. Uh, so that's going to have a huge impact on the video game market moving forward. And that's why you get the same four sports games every year, but with small changes, because they take the same thing. They release it, call it NBA 2K20, and make millions of dollars off of the Ultimate Team stuff. That they that is the real reason people play for the most part, you know. Right, right. So, uh, you know, bottom line, let me ask you straight up: Where do you think the video game industry is going, and do you think it's a a good direction that it's going? Well, I think it's definitely. Sorry, I did it again. I really keep don't mean to keep hitting that mic. Um, it's definitely heading more towards all the subscription services, especially with Google Stadia. Um, that's the big one that's coming out that's going to be a, um, a service. But a lot of the 
the differentiating thing here is that some of these subscription services are streaming based. So you're not like with Games Pass, you're downloading the games to your console. Whereas with Stadia and the PlayStation version of that, you're streaming it. Right. So if your internet can't handle that, then and there are lots of places where people's internet can't, then that service is nothing to you. It's meaningless. So I think we're still kind of it's still kind of in its infancy. And I think as internet continues to grow and get more high speed, then the streaming and the subscriptions will become probably the dominant way of doing business. Um, but now I think we're kind of in between. You know, we're yeah. still getting big single player games like Fallen Order, but we're also still getting things like Destiny, where, you know, it's it's supported for two years and, and monetized the same way. Yeah. Do you think it, do you think the gaming industry is is looking up or do you think we've got a rough road ahead of us? That's a good question. Um, I think, I think in terms of profits, it's looking up, but I think in terms of creativity and art, it's probably looking down because when the business, the investors behind these companies realize that they can make triple the profit with half the work by doing, you know, things that can be easily monetized, then I think that's going to stifle, um, more creative endeavors, more creative projects, and they're going to be harder to get made, um, for the sake of the art form. And I think I tend to agree with that assessment that there's always going to be profit in there. And I think what's going to suffer is the quality of what we get. And ultimately, you know, the consumer, we're going to be paying more money for lower quality product. Um, and I just think that's the way things go in general until it reaches a point that we have to turn things around. Always end on a positive note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> Given the topic, it's a positive note from what we've talked about in the last couple of episodes. Yeah, um, that was all that I had. Was there anything that you that we missed? Uh, just one thing. I, I know you had mentioned the other shows we did, and they were more serious topics. But I do think that this is a very serious topic as well because it is affecting miners, and it is a huge economic uh, machine that I don't think many people take seriously. And that's part of the reason why they can make so much money off of children and of people that you know, are sucked into this monetization. So I think the more serious we take it, you know, it'll be easier to regulate it. And I agree. And, and, you know, when you had first proposed it, um, I, I didn't think it, it really fit in line with the other shows until I did the research. Um, and, and after doing a couple of days worth of research, I realized that this is serious. You know, the fact that we have governments that are forming laws to govern this, uh, the fact that we have kids who are highly susceptible to, cyber addiction and gambling to begin with are being targeted by this. This is a significant topic and I don't think it's any, it's one that's going to be going away anytime soon. So any f closing remarks before we head out? I think that's all I got. All right. That's it uh, for today. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you folks want to get in touch with us, we would love to hear your feedback. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. You can check out the video version of the podcast at youtube.com slash insights into things. You can get the audio podcast at podcast.insightsintotomorrow.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. And obviously if you're watching now, you can see us on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. And finally, you can get us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. And I think that's it for us. Another one in the books. Bye.